This is FinTech Hawaii. Community matters here. Welcome. This is Craig Thomas, your host on Much More on Medicine, part of ThinkTech Hawaii's live stream series, and assisted, as always, thank you, by Rich and Ray, our engineers. And joining me today are Carol McNamee and Archie Kale from MAD Hawaii. And uh, I'm delighted you're here. Uh, a theme of our spring has been the various elements, both within medicine, but in a larger uh, uh, community that impact health. Yes. And so we've talked about ocean safety, uh, narcotics utilization, as well as uh, some aspects of the pre-hospital and medical systems. And something I've learned over the years, if you can prevent an injury or illness, you're way ahead of the game. And huge progress has been made. I know that this has been a long struggle um, but despite driving many more miles and having many more drivers uh, since I started, God help us, about 40 years ago, um, <laughs> the uh, number of drunk driving fatalities has decreased by almost threefold. Um, that's fabulous. When I started, if you didn't spend a Friday night picking glass out of some drunk person's forehead where they went through the windshield because, A, they were drunk, B, they were unrestrained, and C, the windshields used to shatter in ways that uh, put glass in foreheads. If you hadn't had this pleasure every Friday night, uh, you, your week was incomplete. Those events yes. are rare now, but we still see lots of people who are either drunk driving themselves or are injured by drunk drivers, and um, just this weekend, I uh, overheard a conversation, a couple of young guys, Young guys are always a problem, um, who are <laughs> yes. lamenting the fact that, why, only two beers might put them over the limit. You know what the trouble with only two beers is? You are not the driver you were before the two beers, but besides that, you feel like Superman. So I think that, in a nutshell, is the problem we're facing. And so I'm glad you're both here, because you represent an opportunity to mitigate this. And I'd like to start with you, Carol, because I think it was about 20 years ago that uh, you and I first met. And at least. <laughs> at least. And embarked on some legislative uh, efforts of varying success. And I'll be honest, I've been a slacker. I sort of moved on to some other things. But I've always been aware of the problem and admired your effort and persistence. So I'm glad you're here. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm here, too. And uh, um, thank you for uh, using the word persistence. And uh, I, I can remember back when we first started, and um, another friend of mine who's been with Matt almost as long as I have, well, the two of us would say, we'll just do one more year. We'll, we'll just give it five years, and that's it. You know, we, we started this, but we're going to walk away from it because there are all these other people are going to come out and take it over and we're going to solve all the problems and live happily ever after. <clears throat> Unfortunately, as you mentioned, this has not happened. And, and, and it, for me, it was just impossible to walk away when you see what the crime of impaired driving does to people. We look at a lot of statistics, but so much of what MAD does is to support the victims. And when you do that and you see what happens when a drunk, a drunk or drug driver uh, causes a crash and there is a victim who is killed, leaving a family um, in, in grief or someone who's injured and taken to a hospital where they might never get better, really, um, <clears throat> that's, that's what gets your heart. And that's what creates the persistence. Because all of this started, actually, almost 35 years ago in Hawaii. Uh, we were the 200th MAD chapter um, established, chartered, and <coughs> um, that was in 1984. And we, um, we really didn't know what we were getting into. <laughs> Uh, and um, 
So it has been difficult, it has been frustrating, it has been challenging, but overall it has been a, um, a magnificent learning experience and, and we are grateful for the successes that we have had. You've had real successes. Uh, as I said, I'm a tremendous admiration of your persistence and your good humor in the face of uh, many obstacles. Uh, and you did allude to something which I think is worth mentioning. We talk about deaths all the time, and obviously that's the ultimate metric. But for every person killed, either a drunk driver, the impaired driver, because it's obviously more than just alcohol uh, themselves, or um, killed by one, there are multiple people injured. Never good to be injured. Never good to come see me in the ER. Um, because it's hard to improve on healthy. So if you're injured, you may get back to baseline. Many do, some do not. And we, we routinely don't focus on those people, but this is, so the people impacted by uh, impaired drivers is much larger than the fatality number. Um, and that's, I think, just something everyone should be aware of. And my real problem with this issue is often these people are just passers-by. They're walking on the side of the road, they're driving another vehicle, they're peripherally but permanently impacted. And right. so uh, the, other, the other issue you also sort of alluded to is it's always easy to get money to impact some heroic save it's much harder to get resource or engagement on making the save unnecessary. So there are many people today, possibly me, possibly either of us, walking around unimpacted by getting run into by an impaired driver. That's fabulous. That's the biggest yeah. success. But it's also under the radar. Well, and one interesting statistic that just came into my mind um, because of what you said is that um, evidently research has found that two out of every three Americans have been impacted by somehow by impaired driving. And you know, I, I, know, I know that I have. Um, I, I don't know about Arky, I don't know about other people in this room, but if you really start thinking, is there a friend, is there a relative? I mean, you yourself maybe have been in some kind of crash. Mm -hmm. uh, it, maybe no one was killed, but was someone injured or, or, or just um, emotionally yes. <laughs> impacted by having someone crash into you or nearly crash into you even. Um, so. So yes, with that kind of a statistic, it is so important that Matt is here and, and all the highway safety partners we work with, I must say, Matt does not work in a vacuum. We do not work by ourselves. We have an extensive group of highway safety partners. Um, many of the years we've had task forces, especially to do um, um, to strive to pass legislation that is really significant. And, um, and, and that brings me to the kinds of things that MAD has done working in collaboration um, with, with task forces. Um, and, and we did this right from the beginning. MAD never worked by itself. But things like raising the drinking age, um, reducing the, the legal blood alcohol level, I actually should say illegal, from 0 0.10, which it was until 19... 80, then it was reduced to 0.08, um, and many, many other things, including ignition interlock, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, getting that, that is the mo most recent um, piece of significant um, legislation that has been passed. And again, we had a whole task force that worked for let's see, from 2007 to 2011 before that bill got passed. We did that in stages because of its complexity. Um, so um, it takes more than a village <laughs> to make change. 
But in addition to uh, in, in the, the legislative work, the public policy work that has been done, Matt has also done a great deal of education. And part of our mission is to prevent underage drinking. So we like to start that education with people, <laughs> children <laughs> yes. and teens and youth who are still in school and then go on from, from there with uh, general education for the whole public. And, and, then, and, then, and then, of course, it's also supporting the victims. Um, and that's its own education and it, um, to get the word out that we have that program and encourage people to call MAD when there has been a tragedy. Um, and there's been a lot of um, publicity about all that's going on on the windward, I'm sorry, on the leeward coast, the Waianae coast, um, which has a, a high level of impaired driving crashes in, 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 that, in that region. Um, so we're very busy because we do have a four-prong mission that includes all those things that I have, uh, that I have mentioned. And, th and in fact, now we're even starting to look at the, at the specific problem of driving under the influence of drugs. Other substances, yes. yes. So there. that's something that is coming into our future um, starting now. <laughs> Sadly, there are many ways to be impaired. So I'm glad that you talked about the spectrum of this because that's what I become convinced also, that it's changing culture is really difficult and that's actually what's required. And protecting people in that process, convincing people uh, that tools and various kinds of legislation are required, and then if they are implemented, that they're actually utilized. All those things are challenging. Well, you know, I think about the term designated driver. <clears throat> That's something we all know about. We all think about that now. Back in 1980 when MAD started um, nationally, and even in 1984 when we started here, that was, that was not a term. Yes. It came, someone, I think it was a chapter in Orange County, California, came up with that term, and it, it, it went viral. It went viral. <laughs> Within uh, that, it went viral, although that wasn't even a word that we no, used then. No, you're right. And, <laughs> and, and that's a good example of a cultural change. Yes. And it's also a cultural change. You should have zero tolerance as the designated driver of drunk at all. Whereas exactly. they used to have this formula, you can drink 1.8, depending how fat you are or whatever. The problem is once you've drunk 1.8, you don't care, you're Superman. We're gonna discuss some specific strategies after the break. Yes. And so we'll look forward yes. to seeing everyone in uh, about a minute. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. You can be the greatest, you can be the best You can be the king, come laying on your chest You can beat the world, you can beat the war You can talk to God, go banging on his door You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock You can move a mountain, you can break rocks You can be a master, don't wait for luck Dedicate yourself and you can find yourself I'm Bill Sharp, host of the Asian Review here on Think Tech Hawaii. Join me every Monday afternoon from 5 to 5.30 Hawaii Standard Time for an insightful discussion of contemporary Asian affairs. There's so much to discuss, and the guests that we have are very, very well informed. Just think, we have the upcoming negotiation between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un. The possibility of Xi Jinping, the leader of China, remaining in power forever. We'll see you then. Some say scuba divers are the poor man's astronaut. At Dive Heart, we believe that to be true. We say forget the moon. Dive Heart can help children, adults, and veterans of all abilities escape gravity right here on Earth. Search DiveHeart.org and imagine the possibilities in your life. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host on Think Tech Hawaii of Pacific Partnerships in Education. Every other Tuesday afternoon at 3 p.m., I hope you'll join us as we explore the value, the accomplishments, and the challenges of education here in the Pacific Islands. Do you want to be cool like me? If so, watch my show on Tuesdays at 1, called Out of the Comfort Zone. 
I sang this song to you because I think you either are cool or have the potential to be seriously cool. And I want you to come watch my show where I bring in experts who talk all about easy strategies to be healthier, happier, build better relationships, and make your life a success. So come sit with the cool kids at Out of the Comfort Zone on Tuesdays at 1. See you there. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way, there's got to be solution, how to make a brighter day. Welcome back. This is your host, Craig Thomas, uh, Much More on Medicine. And as you can see, during the break, we replaced the pretty much irreplaceable Carol McNamee. It took two to do it. I'd like to welcome uh, Joanne Hamagioto and Amy Scrantz, who both uh, are involved with interlock interfaces uh, designed to prevent people who are impaired from operating a vehicle and putting themselves and others at risk. Uh, before we actually address you folks specifically, uh, Arky, I'd like you to talk a little bit about sort of how we got here, what the strategy is, and then we'll demonstrate the advice and talk about where we go from here. Yeah, thanks very much, Craig. Uh, as Carol mentioned, the, uh, the, the law that we worked on for four years and finally got passed in 2011, the so-called ignition interlock law, the ignition interlock, by the way, uh, if you prefer, you can call it an in-car breathalyzer. That's really what it is. Okay. It's an in-car breathalyzer. And uh, uh, Joanne and Amy are going to show us exactly how it works because it's a very fascinating operation. And the first thing that when you see one of these, the first thing you start doing is asking questions, well, how can I cheat it? And they're going to explain how you can't cheat it. So it's a very useful thing. They're going to talk about how much it costs. It's been in effect now for uh, since 2011. And as you know, the, your car won't start if you blow any, anything above a trace of alcohol. Your car won't start. And now since 2011, there have been close to 90,000 episodes, incidents, where people failed to start their car because they had, they had uh, liquor on their breath. And that is a, an incredible number. That's 90,000 potential drunk driving episodes avoided and translate into the, that into how many drunk driving episodes, how many crashes, and possibly how many, how many lives have been saved by that. So with that sort of a framework, uh, I'd like to have them demonstrate and explain in more detail the device. They're also going to demonstrate a non-car breathalyzer, a portable breathalyzer that you carry around with you, which is becoming uh, used by more and more jurisdictions around the country for people who for one reason or another cannot get the interlock, uh, don't have a car or cannot get the interlock on their car. And that's a very effective thing also. And they'll show that after they de demonstrate this, I would like to take a few seconds just to show the future, the long-term future work that the government is doing and the automobile manufacturers are doing on making it impossible for anybody to drive drunk, period, maybe 20 years from now. Let's hope it's not 20 years from now, but uh, sooner, but you may be right. This, yeah. is, this is a big process. Well, anything um, you do that's in car manufacturing, it's going to take 20, 30 years just sure. to get rid of all the old cars. So, There's that. Um, I'm delighted you're here. I am thrilled at the idea we can keep people from even starting uh, their vehicle. I would point out that uh, ultimately maybe we can keep people from horseback riding drunk. That was recently in the news. <laughs> a patient I'm not going to name for confidentiality reasons, uh, persistent riding his bicycle drunk. So we really need to stop people from, uh, you know, uh, imbibing and driving mm -hmm. anything. And as the paper demonstrated recently, uh, front page story uh, on Monday uh, regarding uh, delays in court and the whole sort of process and almost industry around this, uh, we need to get past that. I think this is one of the ways. So thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, and thank you also to um, Arkin Carroll 
for inviting us to join them on this segment we are with smart start and we are headquartered in a great white texas and we are the state's contracted vendor to install ignition interlock as well as provide portable alcohol breath devices we've been saving lives for over 25 years and have prevented drunk drivers from getting behind the wheel to date we've serviced over 1 million clients and have prevented 11 million alcohol positive prevented starts Arky mentioned close to 90 thousand that is just in the state of Hawaii alone that we've stopped drunk drivers from starting their vehicles so that's wonderful since um, the law was implemented in 2011 the interlock law um, we are we have over 2,000 um, service locations uh, in the United States as well as in 18 countries um, with that being said um, we are continuing our mission in setting the standard in alcohol monitoring technology um, the interlock, um, this is how it looks like. It's about the size of a cell phone, uh, a little bit larger than a, than a, a normal cell phone. Um, but this is installed into the vehicle, and what it does is that it pre in order for you to start the car, you have to provide a passing breath test. Um, if it reads alcohol, then it will not allow you to start the vehicle. It is installed in the ignition only. Um, you have to remember it is in um, in interlock, it's an ignition interlock, not an engine interlock. So even if it, um, as you're driving, even if it reads a positive alcohol reading, it will not shut the engine down in any way. You can continue driving. So that's one of the myths a lot of people ask us, will it stop uh, my, my car while, while I'm driving? Um, and this is the only device that will prevent um, someone that have consumed alcohol from starting your car. It separates drinking from driving. As we've been discussing, clearly that's the goal. And if you can prevent one of these <laughs> drinking and driving uh, from occurring, you maximize the chance of safety for both the driver and all the rest of us. Um, and clearly these, there's a whole process that people end up in the situation where if they're going to drive, they are obligated to use one of these devices. Mm -hmm. um, and Honestly, I'm delighted that this is here as an alternative. Um, we are, for better and worse, a uh, culture where driving is integral to most people's lives, and to be able to facilitate that happening in a safe way so they don't end up coming to see me sure. is great. Mm -hmm. um, what are the next steps in demonstrating this? Um, well, we, okay. I'll go ahead and take a test, but we did want to um, talk about a little bit about the um, anti-circumvention features for this device. Okay. So one of them would be a camera. Let me see. That would be here. So it would capture the um, picture of the person taking a test, and that helps us to find out if they're having someone else take the test for them to start up the vehicle while they continue to drive while drinking. So that's the camera that's... Um, installed in the vehicle as well. Can't quite see it on screen. I'm going to go ahead and uh, take it off. So that okay. way you so, so the device is designed to take a picture of who's blowing in the, the tube, so Correct. to speak. Correct. Okay. And that is the only time it's turned on. Um, when someone is requested to take a test from the device, the camera will turn on and capture a picture of the person taking the test. Okay. And that way we can find out if perhaps they were having someone else take the test for them while they continue to drink and drive. So that's one anti-circumvention feature. Another one is there's a random rolling retest. So once they've passed their car and their vehicle's on the road, the device will randomly ask for rolling retest. And that's, again, to ensure that they didn't have someone take the test for them while they continue to drive while they're drinking. So those are some anti-circumvention features within the device. You also have to hum, so it's detecting that it's a human breath taking the test and not maybe an air mattress pump. So I'll go ahead and test it. Um, when you're required to take a test, it does beep, and the LED screen will say blow. <sighs> about a six-second blow. It says analyzing. analyzing. Mm -hmm. And pass. pass. So our device will show the BAC levels, but the clients, it won't show. It'll just say pass or violation. Got it. Mm -hmm. 
And it's calibrated to the legal limit, I assume. And every 30 days, the client will bring the um, device into the shop and have it calibrated. So one comment I'd like to make mm -hmm. is we all talk about the legal limit as if below that, uh, you're fine. Mm -hmm. The truth, of course, is that the risk of crash goes up uh, as soon as you start drinking. There are, of course, other reasons to be impaired. If you're really tired, I'm a shift worker, driving home in the morning, that's dangerous. I'm legal, but I'm dangerous. Mm -hmm. And of course, as Carol alluded to at the end of the last segment, there are certainly other impairing substances. So this is a challenge for all of us, but um, I'm delighted that the device exists and it seems a great tool for prevention. Let me add, may I add one yeah. thing, sorry to interrupt. This, uh, the device is paid for by the offender. It costs mm -hmm. the state absolutely nothing. The, defend, the offender pays uh, a, a, an amount that, that, that's, that's uh, pretty much the cost of one drink per day in a bar. So it's, it's, if they, were, they got caught because they were drinking and uh, frequently they say, well, I can't afford to install one of these things. But they, they damn well can because they, uh, that's what they've been spending on, on drink. And that's the same for the portable device as for the uh, interlock, the hard breath. Okay, and so that's good news. And very clearly, uh, since it's uh, mitigating the number of people driving impaired, there are a number of other cost savings, which of course are more difficult to quantify, but we shouldn't forget that overall, the number of fatal events uh, since m these efforts, including this one, were implemented, have dropped uh, to about a third. So very clearly there are large savings. And the biggest savings, it's not dollars, it's people still alive, or people able to walk, or think, or whatever. I, I will tell you, we all know this, uh, anybody, anybody over 18 knows it's better to have been uninjured at all than to be recovered. And um, life, among other things, is the accumulation of injuries, and I've had plenty, and uh, I'm not quite the same as a result. And so that's the other big goal. Should we talk about this long-range thing? Or yeah, I think now's that? a good time. Okay. I just, as I mentioned at the head, uh, the government, uh, many foreign governments, as well as the United States, uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and uh, most of the major auto U.S. automobile manufacturers are in a, on a, in a coalition to develop the ultimate, ultimate weapon, and that is what's called a passive detection device, mm -hmm. meaning nobody has to do anything. Nobody has to blow. Nobody has to install anything. Cars will be built with a with a built-in uh, one-second detection of your alcohol content. And rather than me try to explain it, we have a 45-second video, if you could. Uh... Actually, I don't think we're going to have to wrap up without being able to see the oh, video. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. sorry but um, uh, it's clearly a fascinating topic. And as we discussed earlier, there are many ways of impairment. So I'm hoping as the... Uh, uh, technology evolves that will be able to detect alcohol impairment, my uh, post uh, night shift impairment, and all the substances people are experimenting with. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for coming, and Carol also, uh, because uh, an injury or death prevented is the goal for health. Um, and I'd thank, like to thank all of you for joining us, uh, and we'll see you next week. We're going to be talking about care coordination about health system, across health systems, which is also a key element in health. Thank you.